This episode of the Memory Palace is brought to you by Article. We are big fans of Article here at the Memory Palace. This room of the palace, um, the ballroom where I'm sitting right now, um, it's palatial, trust me, um, is lit beautifully uh, by a legit beautiful lamp from Article. This stuff is of extraordinarily high quality. Um, it is truly lovely furniture that's influenced by you know mid-century modern and Scandinavian styles. Um, I have a feeling you're really going to like it. If you've never checked it out before, you know, summer and warmer weather is right around the corner here in the Northern Hemisphere. And they really have fantastic outdoor furniture. It's totally worth checking out. Go to article.com and take a look. The stuff looks great and it is made with all these outdoor friendly materials like teak and acacia wood and granite and galvanized steel and rattan. And it comes to you with a flat delivery fee of $49, regardless of what you're buying and how big the order is. So go to www.article.com slash memory palace and get $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. That is www.article.com slash memory palace. Go check it out. I'm excited to tell you guys about a new sponsor that solves the underlying problem of furniture shopping, which is you look at the stuff online and you have no idea whether it's going to actually work in your room. Well, say hello to Modsy. With Modsy, you can see new furniture in a 3D model of your actual room and redecorate it until you get your room just right. You're going to send Modsy a few photos of the room, going to answer a short online style quiz, and that's it. Then you have this sort of 3D model of your room, and then you can take furniture that they have from all these great partners, like Crate and Barrel and West Elm, and spin them around, and you can see exactly how they're going to look in your space. And there's no more, you know, crossing your fingers and just hoping it's going to fit, or crossing your fingers and just hoping that the colors aren't going to clash. You can swap stuff out until you find just the right thing you're looking for. So head over to modsy.com slash memory and you can get yourself a 20% discount on your first room. That's M-O-D-S-Y dot com slash memory. This is the Memory Palace. I'm Nate DiMeo. People said the house was haunted. And that was even before the two girls started talking to the dead. Kate Fox was 11. Her older sister Margaret was just about marrying age. She was 14, when they moved into the little house in the Nothing Village, 40 miles east of Rochester, New York. The girls had moved around a lot in their short lives, particularly in the last several years since their mom left their dad, when dad's drinking got to be too much. But now they're all together again. Their father seemed to be on the wagon for good this time, and he had found enough work shoeing horses to afford the rent in the little house in Hydesville. And he probably got a pretty good deal, what with the ghost and all. Their neighbors would talk about the traveling salesman who had been invited inside years before and was never heard from again. Never heard from, that is, until one night in March of 1848, when Mr. and Mrs. Fox first heard the strange sounds coming from somewhere behind the living room wall. Some nights it would sound like knocking, other nights like furniture moving, and it always seemed to be coming from the bedroom their daughter shared. Their parents would run in, hoping to catch them mid-prank. But when they opened the door, the girls would be fast asleep, and they didn't believe that their daughters could be tricking them. These were just girls. But they were tricking them. What started with a little tap-tapping on the wall, and tiptoeing back into bed, a hand over a mouth, a face in a pillow suppressing giggles, got more and more sophisticated as the nights went on. The sisters found that if they tied twine around an apple, and tossed it across the room, and quickly reeled it back in, The apple would skitter and skip along the floor and ricochet against the walls and furniture and sound an awful lot like the restless wandering of a murdered door-to-door salesman. And on the night of March 31st, the Fox sisters revealed the latest in their growing repertoire of ghost simulation techniques. They called their mother into the room and told her that Kate had made contact with the spirit. She then snapped her fingers once and they heard a tap in response. She snapped twice, and it tapped twice. The next night, the foxes and all of their neighbors squeezed into the girls' candlelit room and waited for the spirit. At dawn, the audience slipped out of the house, convinced that they had just spent the night in the presence of a dead man and two girls with incredible powers. Mr. and Mrs. Fox were scared. Their daughters could not stay in that room anymore. So they sent them to live with their older sister, Leah, and her family. Leah was responsible. She'd look after them. 
but they found that the ghost followed the girls. And Leah found an opportunity. Before long, thanks to Leah's management, the Fox sisters were selling out a 400-seat theater in Rochester. By 1850, the then 13-year-old Kate and the 16-year-old Margaret were the toast of New York City. People would wait in line for hours to buy tickets to see them, so they could ask the sisters to ask the spirit for word of their dead loved ones on the other side. The rich and famous would come backstage to meet the girls. The newspaper man Horace Greeley took them under his wing and introduced them to private clients who would pay the sisters to introduce them to the departed. Greeley also introduced them to New York nightlife, to the wine and whiskey that had nearly drowned their alcoholic father and destroyed their family. And in the pages of his newspaper, Greeley introduced the Fox sisters to the world. There were other mediums. There had been many other people who claimed to speak to the dead. But there was something about these sisters that people believed. They were innocent, pretty girls. And they were very, very good at what they were doing. They kept submitting to the challenges of skeptics and kept passing every test. Even people who were utterly convinced that this was all a trick couldn't explain how they did it. And everyone else, they wanted to believe. This was the 1850s. People just died all the time from diseases and minor flus and infections, things that don't kill us now. Their family members, their friends, their kids die in childbirth, in accidents at work and at home. Why wouldn't they want to believe that those they loved weren't gone, that those they lost could be found? Soon people were holding seances like we hold dinner parties. They were putting their faith in tarot readers and mystics. Some were just scam artists, others were just wrong. They were just seeing things that weren't there. But all of them together were changing America and the way its people thought about death and life. And this modern spiritualism, that was Greeley's phrase, stayed near the center of American life for decades to come, even as it left the sisters who started it all behind. On October 21st, 1888, a 54-year-old Margaret Fox sat on the stage of the New York Academy of Music in front of 2,000 paying customers. And she spoke to the dead. And then she showed the audience how she spoke to the dead. She had recently lost her appetite for the whole business. And she wanted to get back at her older sister, Leah, whom she believed had been taking too big of a cut for years. So she told the people in the theater about how 40 years earlier, back in that little house in that nothing town, after a few nights of knocking and tiptoeing and tying strings to apples, she and her little sister realized that they could both crack their toes. They could just tense their feet and there would be this sound. And they found that no one could tell that they were doing it. And so people actually believed they were talking to the dead. And that was fun. She told them how they were happy to find out that that weird little sound could carry all the way to the back of a big theater. She told them how later, when they were famous and fancy people would come to their fancy apartment on 42nd Street, a customer could be sitting all the way across the room from Margaret or Kate, and one of them would crack her toe, and the customer would be sure she was just tapped on the shoulder. Because sounds are hard to place in space, and because you'll pretty much believe anything if you really want to believe it. She revealed all of that, but not everything. There were some things that were private, some things that maybe she didn't even understand herself. So she didn't tell them about how both she and her little sister started to unravel. Not long after Horace Greeley introduced them to the world, and to worldly things like power and wealth and wine, things that had brought down people far better prepared for them than two kids from way upstate. She didn't tell them about how she and her sister struggled under the growing weight of their shared secret. She didn't talk about the times that Kate went further and further with her claims, moving beyond toe-crack conversations to moving furniture, to making ghostly hands appear out of thin air, at least in the minds of desperate believers, or how she couldn't be sure how much her increasingly erratic sister believed her own nonsense. And that night in the theater, at the age of 54, she certainly didn't tell them about the time she tested her own belief. In 1852, the fame and money and parties brought a man named Elijah Kent Kane to one of her seances. She was 18, he was 32, and handsome, and a celebrated Arctic explorer. 
So she fell in love with him. And he loved her, but he didn't love her profession. He was Catholic, and his family was very Catholic. And there was no way they were going to approve a union between their God-fearing son and this godless woman who was spreading blasphemy. So she gave it up, and she and Cain began an affair. And they were happy for a few years. And she was sure a marriage proposal would come any day, until the scurvy Cain had been fighting for years finally killed him in 1857. Margaret didn't tell the audience how she broke down one night, despondent and alone, and tried to contact her dead love, how she tried to do for real what she had spent the last decade pretending to do. She didn't tell them how she called out to him, and how he didn't call back, and how she sat in the dark, knowing that he never would, and knowing that she would never be able to feel the comfort that the people who paid to see the sisters felt when they heard that their loved ones were at peace, or that they had been forgiven, or that they were always the one, of course they were, or that they would never be forgotten. Kate and Margaret Fox weren't forgotten, but at the times of their deaths, they weren't remembered fondly. Each died poor, neither living to see 50. The people who still clung to spiritualism were glad to see them go, and the people who never believed they were two. Now there's a postscript here that really can't be resisted. And you can do with it what you will. In 1904, they tore down that little house in that nothing town. And inside one of the walls, near what had been the girl's room, they found the skeleton of a man believed to be a traveling salesman who appeared to have been murdered a few years before the Fox family moved in. 